welcome Derwin Banks, the owner of High Barn Isles, based in West Sussex, the director of Brighton & Hove Food Partnership, and one of the few farmers in the UK growing linseed. I was really excited when Derwin agreed to uh, come on my show for an interview to talk about flax meal and the oils that he actually produces in small batch production, because for me, flax oil and the flax tea are key staples in my treatment with clients. So to find someone local actually producing it was actually superb, and I was truly very excited. So... You know, I'm all for us finding food and sourcing it locally, and Derwin is one of those people. So, welcome, Derwin. Hello, Debs. Good to hear from you. Thank you very much. So, can you give us some background to yourself as a farmer of of linseed, and what led to you starting to grow it? Well, we've always been farmers, and um, myself and Wendy and Gay are partners in the farm now, and... um, Linseed, we, we've always grown linseed as part of a rotation because you have to rotate it because otherwise um, disease can build up in the in the soil. So rotation is really important. And um, it started really quite by serendipity. Um, all of all of our young lives on the farm were extremely difficult. Uh, just a small family farm, you know, we didn't really have any money. So that led me all the time to think of a make a million idea. And of course, I've thought of a few, and a number have failed. Um, but one of the one of the ideas I had was to build a still and to distill chamomile, uh, which I did successfully. Although, of course, we weren't able to grow enough to wholesale it, and I didn't have enough money to turn it into creams and things. And um, so I thought, well, maybe we can sell the still and build a couple of those. There was an interest in that area. Uh, and somebody came along and said, "Oh, we're pressing hemp. Would you like to see what we're doing?" And we went to see them, and they had this little press. Uh, and I was growing some linseed that year as well. And something made me think, that's an oil seed. I can do it. Uh, so from that really small kind of little hint, uh, that's how I started. And I, I got a press. And um, uh, because obviously I knew that when you feed your animals uh, linseed, their coat shine, um, I just started to go around. If anybody got a stable or a small farm, um, I knocked on their door and said, would you like to buy a bottle of oil uh, for your animals? Uh, and eventually I got um, merchants uh, in the south selling it. Uh, but gradually I learned more about linseed and what it contains in the omega-3s, 6s and 9s and so on. And it, probably within about a year, I'm talking about 12 years ago, within about a year I'd got capsules made, which we call pods, um, because it's much more like food than a supplement. And um, I was uh, selling oil as well to individuals um, all over the country, going to shows and exhibitions. So it started from a very, very tiny base uh, that we knew nothing about anything. Uh, and um, now I know quite a little bit about the oils and fats, and I hope I know you came to our little talk the other night, and uh, I hope my sort of little museum of linseed and flax artifacts illustrated, um, uh, you know, the whole process and how oils and fats and food is important for us. You do have the most wonderful museum, I have to say, uh, of, 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 of these bizarre artifacts, including things like lozenges and stuff from the past, which just, uh, I was astonished at it. V for victory, do you want to discover a little bit of that? Well, I think most uh, people sort of 60 or so might remember Victory V's. Um, they have a little uh, sort of khaki coloured lozenges for your throat. And um, on the front of them, of course, was printed linseed, licorice and chloridine. Uh, <laughs> so when I do my talks, I often ask people if they remember these or if they were addicted to them. And sometimes the hand goes up. And, of course, they would have been addicted because the chloridine is a derivative of opium. Yes. That's why... <laughs> That's why you can't get them now. So that always raises a little laugh. Um, but it just helps to, you know, set, set the tone of things. Not, not too serious, but, but to get a serious message across using my artifacts. But what, Lindsay, what you really showed and, and what you've got as artifacts is you, you, you showed that actually Lindsay was far more used in our society in, in bygone years than it is now. Well, yes, it was. It, it, I mean, it's a major part of making lino for the floor. I mean, every house in the country and all over the world probably had lino on the floor. And, of course, there was a byproduct from the lino, and that was linseed oil cake. 
uh, and um, that was used to feed animals. About 20% of an animal's ration could be linseed or cake, and um, that had an impact on the fatty acid balance of the animal that you were eating. So the animals that you're eating up, up to 50 or 60 years ago were probably a lot closer to the wild animals we would have hunted um, uh, than they are today. That's fascinating because, you know, we are fundamentally deficient in ALA and our essential fatty acids, which is what this is. But And what you're saying there is that our cattle were originally fed these linseed cakes, which... and which would have enabled us to have that in our diet. Yes, and they also, you know, maybe farmers way back then hadn't maybe quite improved their pastures quite as much as they are today. So there was maybe a mixture of of herbs and clover and things and a lot more hedges. And, of course, animals self-select their medication if they're ill or anything. So they would have also been making omega-3 in their bodies from the green things like fish make it from plankton and so on. Um, so animals do the same kind of thing. So how an animal was uh, f- fed itself and how the farmer looked after it had a great impact on how it was when we came to, when we came to eat it. It is fascinating because I actually, um, my dog every day, because I make flax tea for the clinic, my, my my dog gets all the seeds in her dinner every day and everybody says about how wonderful her coat is and even though she's a lurcher and you see lurchers and they're always freezing cold they're always shaking you know, even in summer and yet she does not feel the cold anymore it's taken me a number of years to get her to that point but I have no doubt it's the flax that's done that and also what's been fascinating for me is my dog's 13 years old and when people see her running round they cannot believe that she is that age. Yes, well, yes, it is true. I mean, in, in the early days when I started doing it, eventually a few people told me about what happened to their dogs. Uh, and, of course, dogs are suffering from a lot of the same kind of food-related illnesses that we are. Uh, you know, they're very similar they're very similar to us. Um, so when you uh, get some of the right raw materials, because we're all little chemical factories, biochemical factories, and uh, when you put the right raw materials into our factory, we operate in a much better way, as we've designed to. Yeah, well, it, you know, if, if basically our cattle are not getting this linseed as they would used to have done and, and the and omega fats, then fundamentally our animals are not getting it. So it's no wonder in some respects that they're getting the same illnesses. Yes, and of course the animals have been bred to be a lot leaner, uh, you know, a tremendous amount has gone into the breeding of, of, of the animals. And, uh, of course, you know, we don't want wheelbarrow loads of saturated fat, mm-hmm. but uh, saturated fat I don't think killed us in the same way as um, adulterated oils like margarines and so on. Mm-hmm. They're just industrial products, which, you know, our Stone Age people are not designed to have in our systems. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it, it's interesting that you touch on the margarine side of things. Let's come back to that in a bit because, you know, we'll talk on about the Joanna Budwick work, which links really nicely with what you're doing. Um, it, I have a friend who gives her chickens the flax seeds, and she's noticed a considerable difference with the eggs. Do you find that people buy your seed for their chickens and things like that? Um, the odd person uh, mixes the oil up with their chickens, and you might have seen the Columbus people actually sell omega-3 eggs. Uh, and that's putting um, the linseed oil in the rations for the chickens. And in the past, if you've ever had any eggs and they've tasted fishy, uh, that's too much fish meal going in. But what that does actually give you a good indication of is how quickly what you feed your animal comes through into the embryo because the egg is obviously an embryo for the next generation. And that's really why it's important for for us and ladies, especially if they want to be pregnant, to make sure they're eating the right kind of food. You're absolutely right. And uh, I have to say, my French chickens are some of the glossiest chickens I've ever seen, which is quite funny. We do laugh about it. They they do look lovely. (laughs) So just tell me, what type of seed are you using? Because I know there's a number of different varieties and can you tell me about the whole process as well that you actually go through? What do you mean from planting? Yes. Uh, this is this is when you want me to tell you about sitting on the on the earth with your bare bottom. <laughs> you wouldn't mind. <laughs> you, you, you've shared that already, but you're you're about to share it to a few more thousand oh, people. <laughs> 
that that was a little bit of a joke, really. But when when the when the land is warm enough to to plant your seeds, I say that that's what I do, and I invite people to come and help me do that. But of course, I never get any takers. <laughs> So the seeds are the seeds are planted at the end of March, uh, beginning of April, and um, what you really want, obviously, is nice, lovely spring weather, um, that uh, some you know, nice rain and sun, and the plants grow quickly. Uh, and um, we we don't grow ours organically uh, because it's quite difficult. And one of the main things that can ha- happen, if if for instance you you plant and then you have you know a couple of weeks of really cold weather, you might have just two little leaves. Um, come up uh, that that stage, or two or three little leaves, and then um, the gardeners amongst you will will know about flea beetles. Uh, they make little round holes in your plants, and of course, uh, flea beetles can devastate a whole field. So it's really an, a, quite an expensive job to plant it. So we do have to dress the seed, um, and that gives protection for about two weeks, and hopefully. Uh, you know, the, 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 the weather has improved and the plant has grown away from it. When, when they get to three or four inches high, they're really largely unaffected by them, by the flea beetles. And then we don't put any insecticide from there on in on the plants. I think that's the most important thing. We do have to use some weed killers and we use those at this very early stage. Um, and, uh, I don't think there's any residue. And we've had people sort of look at it, kinesiologists and so on, and they couldn't find any any harmful residues we've also had it tested as well so um so that's the planting and then of course uh, once you've planted um, you're in the lap of the gods i guess for the weather uh, so there's always a worry until you actually get it in the barn at the, at the uh, in the autumn which uh, we hope to harvest around about the end of august to beginning of september this year has been quite hard with the with with, with the with the rain and so on, linseed has actually stood up uh, quite well to it. Although the the, the level of crop is, is has been down, um, but we have got it in the barn now. Uh, we had um, two varieties this year, or three actually. We had um, one called Sunrise, which I've grown for a number of years. It's uh, a linseed variety, and another new one this year called Brighton, uh, which uh, when I heard about it, I thought I've got to grow some of that because of my sort of Brighton connection. And um, so I did, and that actually proved to uh, be the bigger producer of, of, of all of the seeds. And then we just have a, a few acres of a golden variety um, for um, uh, baking with and that kind of thing. Um, there's very little difference uh, nutritionally between the gold seed uh, and uh, the brown seed. Uh, but if you're baking with it, obviously you get a lighter uh, golden uh, colour, uh, you know, with your bread or your flapjack or something like that. But um, and there's a slight difference in taste to the golden one; is just a little bit, um, a little bit uh, lighter, lighter in taste. Um, and actually, uh, the variety we've grown this year, I can't remember, but in previous years we've grown one called marmalade. <laughs> and when we've got a footpath through the field, you could walk through the field and go home and say to your friends, oh, I've been walking through marmalade and it would be a lie. <laughs> oh, fabulous. <laughs> and you, I remember in the talk, you said it was like, a, when it was growing, it's like a, a field of water. Yes, you could often, you know, you'd be driving along a road and you see a field of um, linseed behind the hedge and you think it might be a lake, but um, of course, actually, it's a field of fat. Um, but of course, it's the good, the, the good fats, um, omega three. Yeah. There's six and nine in there as well. The omega three and omega six are both called essential fats, yeah. um, and you know, you know that's because it's it's just not made in the body, and that's why we have to have them in. And it's important to have the balance of those two. And of course, the Stone Age balance was about one to one, but um, today there's just so much of the cheap vegetable oils around, and we we we, we kind of get. 10, 15 times and probably sometimes even more of the omega-6s and they might be adulterated in some way, um, like heated or turned into margarines and that kind of thing. And as a consequence, um, the impact on our health is 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 really quite high. Mm-hmm. I only got to ask the question about what sort of things happening to us and, and because the omega-3, most people know, is, is associated with um, helping you with joints and so on, anti-inflammatory, Omega six is pro-inflammatory, and so it's about balance. And you can see if you've got one to one, you know things are okay. But if you've got ten and fifteen times more of the six, 
you know, chances are more inflammatory disease, and that is in fact what's happening in the population. We get more inflammatory disease. So oils and fats are really, really crucial, but they're most abused. It is interesting because obviously people, when they are eating fats, they do, you know, you've got the whole low fat issue. So people are either cutting them out completely um, with, and being fairly ignorant about that and even avoiding up things like avocados. And then you've got the other extreme where people are, like you say, are eating, um, you know, I call it bastardized oil effectively, which is all you, your spreads and your vegetable oils, which are just so fundamentally dangerous to the body. You know, so it's almost like you have this whole extreme going on continuously, and you're absolutely right. You know, it, do, it is causing massive inflammation, and people do not realise what they're fundamentally doing to themselves. No, and it's also impossible to work out by if you look at any products you'll get from a store, it might say it has polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fats on. Less likely now to see hydrogenated fats, although they still do do occur. Um, uh, it's impossible to work out from just those words what the balance of oils and fats going into your body because the important thing for you to know is how much omega-3 is in there and how much omega-6 where they come from has it been heated up and that kind of thing and um it's just it's just nearly impossible and just going back to the heating a minute uh, you know oils and fats are not only abused by turning them into margarines that was the old-fashioned way of doing it <clears throat> which was hydrogenation even all these modern spreads are still oil Liquid at room temperature turned into a solid. That's an industrial process too. So why would us Stone Age people want to do that? It just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Uh, and then people in the home as well um, are so afraid of saturated fat. But in fact, if you're roasting or frying anything, it's saturated fat you use. And if you're a vegetarian, that can be coconut oil. The reason is saturated fat is unaffected by heat. You don't need wheelbarrow loads of it, but... It's the, the argument you're having with your body is do I want something going into it that, that is unharmed or something has been harmed by heat. And unfortunately, all the oils are made a bit more like uh, plastic um, when, when you heat them up. Mm. So it's just not a thing to do. You know, use them cold on your food afterwards. That's how you can use my, my linseed oil. You can put it into smoothies or into um, uh, salad dressings or mashed potatoes with it, or the cottage cheese, lots of different things, but never heat it. And, and if you use it like that and other oils as well, you can work out the balance a bit for yourself. Now, the, the, you're talking about the margarine um, issue there. And, um, you know, what you're talking about is the research done by Joanna Budwig, who was, um, she, she was nominated for the Nobel Prize, I think it was about eight times, but the margarine industry, is my understanding, uh, constantly put a stop to that happening. Now, um, just, just, can you just talk about Joanna Budwig's work in a little bit more detail, if you know, if you know about it? Well, yes, I think that... Um... In, in my very early days, I very quickly came across, across Joanna Budwig because of, um, you know, using the internet and researching into the oils and fats. And um, uh, it, not much research had been done. And in fact, I think they thought essential fats in those days were n nothing more than vitamins. Um, so it was great when she started to, to look at them. And I think by the end of the war, when she started looking at them in the very late 40s, she had... Um, the kind of equipment that could see into the cells a bit more. Uh, and um, so that's what she did. And yes, you say she was nominated for a Nobel Prize. She was actually prosecuted a number of times in Germany for saying what she said about fats. Mm -hmm. uh, but they never succeeded in convicting her. So what she was saying was the truth, um, I believe. And I um, uh, often recall a, a little bit from one of her speeches when she just talked about uh, about the fats and, and their role in the body because they're part of oxygenating the body and what she used to say was picture your heart ready to oxygenate your blood and your lungs ready to supply that oxygen and what do you think your heart is thinking she said while well, your heart is thinking what sort of oil have I got to help with this process? And if your heart finds you've got nice unsaturated fat, the process goes well and you get oxygen in the blood and that gets to the cells where it protects you and heals you, you see. Uh, and um, if your heart finds you've been eating margarine or, or maybe buying oven chips or um, roasting your potatoes in olive oil or rape oil or something, your heart doesn't like that. And it's those 
adulterated oils that um, may be uh, forming the plaque that go into the arteries. And also, if you're using that kind of oil, your, your blood might be circulating more times before it's fully oxygenated. That's what she used to say. I repeat what she says. Um, I haven't, obviously, I'm not a scientist, but I think that, if that sounds right. I think what she says is right. And it paints that lovely picture in your mind about how to think about the facts, I think. Uh, and that's what I try to do uh, for people, you know, and, and, the, and the little sort of canter through the museum uh, uh, of things. The idea is to try and to paint that picture about connection. Um, you know, with the land and fats and how things were, so that hopefully it, it stays with you and you can uh, use it for your advantage uh, in, in, into the future for your, you know, for your diet. Well, you know, when you were talking about the, the process and being in the lap of the gods with the with the weather and things like this, the you know, sun is fundamental to the growing of your of your crop, but also the the the, the, the activity, the, the light from the sun fundamentally interacts with our cellular membrane and it's that photon activity that enables us to function properly on many levels uh, because that cellular membrane is made out of the fats and so her work and I'm just going to mention the book Flex Oil is a True Aid um, Against Arthritis, Heart Infection, Cancer and Other Diseases for, for my audience is well worth getting it's um, how many pages long it's only about 30 or 40 pages long has her lectures in it some of her lectures are key lectures absolutely worth getting hold of if you want to understand um, far more about why flax why you should include these type of oils in your diet that we're talking about today brilliant so now, just, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, if, if you want to find out more, you can go on to the Budvik Centre, which is their website, which talks about a lot of different things like that. But it's support, it's support, uh, support with people with uh, with cancer. And I think it's when, when they're diagnosed, they're at the very lowest ebb and kind of don't know what questions to ask and really disempowered. Uh, and getting information about some basic uh, dietary things that you can do to support yourself is really, really important before you decide what kind of route you're going to take. And that was brought home to me, but really by my sister who died uh, with breast cancer, and she had two years of, of quite quite difficult time with, with having chemotherapy. And, and I would love, love to have had her try something different because I think she may may well have had a better time and even possibly extended her life. So information at the very beginning of those kind of problems is helpful. But I'm sure also that if we paid a lot more attention to oils and fats, we would not have so much cancer. And you can really chart the huge rise of those things from, from when we stopped actually making our own food in the mid-50s. Uh, and it just became more industrialised. I agree. It's really interesting. And many, many people go in search of the Budwick work because uh, she does have a protocol which includes flax oil and cottage cheese and a few other bits and pieces uh, to fundamentally help support a cancer picture. So um, go and follow up on the Budwick Centre. Fantastic. So let's just talk a little bit more about... Just explain to me, what is the difference between flax and linseed? Because, um, I, you know, I've always stopped with flax oil. <laughs> and, well, and you must have met my mind then, because I thought that's what we ought to talk about. And, of course, flax, as you saw by some of my artefacts, is what you grow as a farmer if you want to make linen. And, of course, Ireland was famous for Irish linen. And, in fact, it's been grown all over the world and um, rudimentary uh, linen has been found as far back as Neolithic times, so people were getting fibres from plants and so on. But flax is a really tall plant. It doesn't have so many branches. It's about three feet tall, so it doesn't have so many seeds. You can't really tell the difference by looking at the seeds, but obviously if you're a farmer and you want to grow flax uh, for linen uh, and you get the wrong seeds from your merchant – you're pretty cross halfway through the year if you've only got the tall plant, the, <laughs> the short plant. Um, so it's the Americans, I think, that have, have, have kind of it's called every, everything flax. They kind of are really a bit confused on that. But here it's quite uh, easy. If you if you grow flax, you're growing it for the fiber. And often those um, flax plants are pulled before the seeds are viable. And you might really grow another area for the seeds for next year. Uh, linseed is a much shorter plant, and um, 
therefore more of the energy goes into the seeds and there's more branches and more seeds on in seeds. So I think the main issue is if people are growing it for to, to produce oil or to um, sell as seeds, they won't be growing a tall plant with added problems. Uh, you know, if the weather is bad, the wind and rain knocks that all down, they'll be growing the short one. So um, if, you, if you see any flax, so-called flax seeds in the store and you sprinkle a few on the ground, um, the way to tell what they are is if they uh, grow tall, they're flax, and they really are flax, but if they're if they're short ones, uh, they're linseed, so report them to trading standards. <laughs> Saying the wrong thing. But that's that that's the that's the difference. So we grow linseed, so we call it linseed oil. And I think a lot of the people that sell flax oil will actually be selling linseed oil. I think they think the name might be sexier or something, but <laughs> it's it's about the age. Oil oil for your body has only got to be a few days old and with our small batch process on the farm people will order oil and they'll get it maybe four days it might have been four days from being pressed up to a maximum of probably 10 but every week we're pressing fresh oil and after that period it then goes into the animal uh, side of things and you know eventually other settlings later on down the line that goes on to your cricket bat or anything like that. And, of course, oil was used in paint and putty, and we've already mentioned lino. And just to go back to lino for one minute, it actually contains um, antibacterial, it's antibacterial properties, so it was really great in hospitals, and it can last for many years. You can still buy it today. It's called marmolium if you want to have it in the house, but uh, still lino if you want it commercially. And also, if people have got any kind of allergies or problems with allergies, if you have lino on your floor, it's is the word hypoallergenic. It's not. It it, can t- it doesn't contain anything that can bring on allergies. So. I also remember you saying in the talk that the Royal Army Corps called they were called the Linseed Lancers. They were, yes, the Royal Army Medical Corps were called the Linseed Lancers. Um, and I've got a, a book, um, one of their training manuals from 1944, and in, in it has got how to make a linseed poultice, which of course was, you know, if you've got any kind of lesions or probably the um, soldiers had lots of boils, and I, I guess they had those smacked on their boils and. Um, that's no doubt how the name came in. But on the very first page of this uh, book, there's a, a paragraph about the fourth paragraph. And when I found this, I was amazed. And it talked about the cells in the human body and how they're just surrounded by other cells and not by air and water and how elaborate arrangements have to be made to ensure they receive the fuel uh, they need for their work and they're able to get rid of waste. So I, I, I contrast that with, you know, there is a, a government organization in 1944 really saying you need to eat the right sort of food to oxygenate your body properly. Yet today, you know, there's a great embargo on, on, on saying that food can help heal you and, and cure you. And I think we're doing exactly the wrong thing. We need to actually be, um, uh, indicating the foods that we should be eating and making sure that we're able to get them. But instead of that, I'm afraid everyday food is being sold that kills people. And you can see that in the huge amount of money we spend in the health service treating food-related illness, you know, diabetes, obesity, are just the, the simplest ones you hear about. It was only, I was, I was talking to Mark, Dr. Mark Circus last night, who is a Brazilian doctor, and um, the interview will be on in November for that. And he was talking to me about deficiencies and how significant chronic disease was linked with deficiency. So um, that's it, it goes without saying nowadays. I cannot believe that the government continuously ignore that picture. But what the, the time you're talking about, I think, is before they started gener- creating the food pyramid, the government food uh, standards um, in regards to what was you know right for us to be eating, what was the perfect diet, which since that's been in place fundamentally, people, people's health has been reduced significantly. Ironically, <laughs> you don't have to comment on that. <laughs> so, so just tell me, um, what is the difference between your products in particular? Because you would, yeah, and ones that I would normally buy from a supermarket, for instance. Because you were saying about the process of it. Is it that it's just not sitting around as long? 
that, I think that's the that's the main thing. I mean, our, we we our, as I'm sort of pretty stone age person myself. I, I've just got this small cold press and I press into a a 200 litre container and I let nature do the work and um, uh, all I've done is put the tap above the sediment level. So in a couple of days, all the all the, um, the sediment is. is Sunk, sunk to the bottom, I then just filter it simply out through muslin just to get any larger piece out, pieces out. They, that then goes into a 25 litre container, and from then it's settled overnight, and all the bottles are filled by hand, and it's just a beautiful shiny oil, and it hasn't been pumped through filters and all around pipes and so on. And of course, it's fresh, uh, and you know, you've got to think about it like milk. You, you you have it fresh, you take the lid off, you use it every day and you keep it in the fridge. And I can't really see how you can get that lovely fresh oil to people by selling it via supermarkets or shops. Unless, of course, those people are really passionate and they understand about oil um, and they've got a reasonable turnover, then that's great. Uh, and I'd be happy to supply those kind of shops. But I don't want my oil sitting on a shop for a month or even a few weeks before people um, start to use it, because it does definitely does um, lose its uh, lose its um, ability to, to to help you. It oxida- ox- oxidizes, but the omega three is the delicate part of the oil, uh, and that's what you need uh, in your system. So yeah, you've got to you've got to have it as fresh as possible. And in fact, in Germany, they used to deliver it like milk. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> In, in the old days. And um, that's what I was thinking of when you were when you were talking to me about you delivering it first of all, I thought, Oh gosh, you're almost like an old style milkman. <laughs> yeah, we could have somebody with a horse and cart, couldn't we, with a <laughs> going round um, dispensing the oil door to door. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Yeah. And is it... if anybody wants to do that, then get in touch with us. <laughs> and for me the whole process the fact that it's not this big um, manufacturing process when I went to have a look was fabulous. It, it, it fits in so lovely with, in some respects, you know, the Vichy Schauberger work around, um, you know, where he watched how water, when it was pushed through pipes and it was pushed through artificial sort of corners, um, actually changed the molecular structure. It fits in with the Steiner work as well, which is just all about bringing, um, you know, what you're doing back to that small scale and it all being hands-on because it's that connection that makes such a difference and I have to say um, when I test when I, you know when I, I tried your oil and I gave it out to a number of my clients I split it amongst amongst us all to actually see what the difference would be with what they're normally taking everybody came back very very positively and I, I use and I only recommend a very good oil anyway and actually everyone loved your oil the, the taste of it is very different and the, the feel of it is very different within the body and if for, for those people who are truly connected you will really feel a difference with this oil and it's almost a bit like biodynamic farming where you actually experience the difference in the food i do think you've managed to capture that with with your with your production and it's full of passion as well of course yes and that's what matters, you know. Let, let's just let's just talk about, you know. Um, I remember you saying in the talk you believed in making true foods, and I think, you know, I'm going to ask you what do you mean by that? But I I think you started to touch on it there with the passion side. Well, I I, I mean we we talked about sort of in the broad terms of farming. It seems to have become far more industrialized and, and there's just so few people engaged in agriculture. I think about three quarters of a percent and the average age is about 60. And they're really just supplying commodities. Uh, and I think maybe uh, it's all kind of missing the point and we're throwing so much food away too. And nowadays, you know, I've heard figures like 30 to 40 percent of food is thrown away and we're probably eating 25 percent too much. So the idea that we couldn't feed ourselves, I think, it's not quite right, and maybe if a bit of money was diverted from all these wind farms uh, and put into windmills, if every town had a windmill and we could maybe get back to proper bakers, because bread as well is something that all, all the goodness is taken out of out of bread, and a, you know, a local windmill producing good um, flour and uh, a local baker could produce lots of. Uh, 
I don't think it would have to be hard, horrible Victorian type jobs, but I'm sure there's lots of people would love to do that kind of thing. Because people are so disconnected with ev- everything, uh, and and people obviously um, uh, d- define themselves by what they did in the past, and names reflected that, don't they? Mister uh, Butcher or even Mister Mister Miller obviously did that job, and Mister Baker too. So if we could get back to people doing things and contributing to society, their self-esteem would be raised and the whole thing would just get better. Sorry, that's that's straight off the point a little no, bit, no. I think. I, I completely agree. I, I truly believe that we have lost our connection to, to nature in so many ways. And one of that is through food, which is why we accept the level of food that comes out of supermarkets um, because the quality is so, so poor. The taste is non-existent. Therefore, the nutrients in it for me are almost non-existent. And I think that's what, you know, you are one of the proponents of. And that's what's really, truly important for me to, you know, why I wanted to get you on here today is because you you have that true belief in what food can actually give you, which is that fundamental connection back with nature. Yeah. I think you were actually wrong about the taste there. I think what actually, what I, well, just in one particular area, I think that people get addicted. You know, there's too much sugar and there's addictive properties in some of the food. And um, that's what causes people to just eat or they're hungry or they get up, in a, you know, have a bad day and they go and eat something because they're addicted to that food, not because they need that food. It's this addiction uh, problem to food. Um, and that's a, a difficult one to do. I mean, I, I fall prey myself sometimes. I'm, I'm, I'm not perfect at these things. And you think, now, why on earth am I doing that? And wouldn't it be great if we could devise some way of, of helping more people to think, uh, you know, let, let's try and be a bit better with food and that would help our self-esteem and, um, you know, the whole thing would be better for us. Uh, and if we could do more local food, I mean, that's what, um, as I said, you, you said earlier, I think I'm, I'm a uh, director of the Brighton and Hope Food Partnership, and that, they wrote a lovely document called Spade to Spoon, which has just been revised. Um, and um, the Primary Care Trust gave us the um, job of providing nutritional services for Brighton and Hove. So we've got a great uh, a job to do there, and they've done some fantastic work with teaching people about allotments and food in general and all sorts of different programs. So that's been really great. Um, and uh, I've been privileged to be on there. I'm down for re-election again this year, but I, I hope I will get re-elected. Okay, so we need to... Can everybody vote for Derby? <laughs> Join the food partnership. So go on to the uh, Brighton and Hove Food Partnership website. Have a look at it. Read that spade to spoon document, which is just brilliant. And um, I guess really you need to be in Brighton and Hove, but uh, Brighton and Hove, you join or within, say, 30 miles, I guess, which is, I'm, I'm closer than that. Um, and uh, it's some, something to see. And during the, the, with the rewriting of the, um, of the uh, document spade to spoon this year we had some background information and one of the f- figures which absolutely staggered me was 77 million pounds a year in brighton and hove alone on just obesity and i thought wouldn't it be great if we could just divert that money to food uh it'd be so much better for people rather than eating themselves ill yeah. if we just ate ourselves well mm-hmm. anyway i think it's going to need a bigger revolution than i can provide for that I don't know. I think I'm meeting a lot of different people whilst I'm interviewing, and everybody's creating a small, a small ripple in their own pond. And quite frankly, I think all those ripples at some stage are going to join, and I can't wait for that to happen. <laughs> We're going to have tidal wave. <laughs> Create our own uh, tidal wave, indeed. And I think you're just part of that. That's superb. But I do think it's people like you that are going to make the fundamental difference because. Uh, I think it's the Chinese that say, you know, the adage, which basically it's every journey starts with a small step. And I think, you know, if we're all doing those small steps, and it, it, inevitably it's going to move us all forward. Now, can you just outline the benefits of using your oil or, or flax meal every day uh, over other oils, basically? Have I convinced you to start calling it linseed? Sorry, linseed. Oh, <laughs> that's because I've, uh, for years, as you know, we were trained and we would, it, it was just flax. 
And it's only from your talk that actually I realised that well, I'm not using flex. And the irony, Doreen, is actually that I was originally trained as a weaver. So I know a lot about flax and about how to break it down, how to make it into fibre. I used to spin it. I used to make linen cloth and on an industrial scale and be a designer. So that, that, I actually know about all that side of it, ironically. Isn't that brilliant? And yeah, I think you're right. The, the, I, I, I detect just little changes. I'm, so many people have been... Um, um, attracted in, into my life and in, into the linseed and in, in, even into the last couple of years uh, who uh, are, are passionate about these sort of things. So I think there is just a very little movement uh, right at the bottom of people starting to think a little bit differently. And, of course, if, if people can think differently and change their life, it's, it's empowering. What we, what we want is people to be empowered. Yet what seems to have happened in... You know, the last forty or fifty years, people have been made poorer, and they've made and they've been made iller. Uh, and of course, when you when those things happen, you're you're not empowered. Mm. So we want people to be well, and we want people to you know able to earn a, a living by doing things for the community that raises their self esteem. So fundamentally, what you're saying to the to the original question is that by using your um your your foods, in effect. You, you will feel more empowered because you're getting the right type of nutrients into your body. Oh, yes. I didn't ask the question then at all, did I? I thought it was a lovely way of doing it. <laughs> right. The, the um, yeah, to, to, to use the oil, you can um, mash your potatoes with it, which you can get into the whole family then without any problem or make vinaigrette or put it into your pasta or vegetables, that kind of thing. It can go into smoothies. Um, with the milled seed, you can use it if you bake bread. You can reduce your wheat flour. You'd have to have a little practice about that to get that right, but it can be 10%, maybe up to 20% in some kind of baking. Um, you might need a little bit more liquid in when you use linseed because it absorbs the water. Um, and um, what else? Oh, the I, I, I made a, a muesli for you, didn't I? Do you remember it? Indeed. And that was... Um, uh, you don't always have to cook porridge, so a couple of spoonfuls of porridge oats, a couple of spoonfuls of the linseed meal, a spoonful of the oil, or if you're making it for four or five of you, you can just put a teaspoonful of oil for every person in there. I chop a lot of fruit up um, and pop in it, and um, that can be any fruit in season, uh, so you're getting some fruit as well. And um, uh, then juice. I've, I've got some pineapple juice at the moment. I, I don't think it was pineapple juice in that the other night. Um, uh, and you mix that up and just leave it for uh, to soak for just a very short time. And it's just a delicious uh, breakfast. And if we could get children doing that instead of eating chocolate-covered cereals, we'd have a great leap forward. Well, the, the impact on the blood sugar alone with, with what, you know, the flax now is, is shown to actually... Um, impact on blood sugar and then you've got the oats in there as well so hugely beneficial and like as you were saying the reduction in inflammation over time by using it, it is you know you're, you're starting off your day not with kellogg's cornflakes or your cocoa pops which are in, in, inflammatory products you know you're, you're starting it off with something that, that is only going to set you up for not only the day but also for life yeah i think maybe those people started off making their products with a good good intentions and so on but yeah. i think today it's just far too industrialized and i'm sure that uh, there's a better way uh, and you can just buy the cheapest bag of porridge oats can't you in the store and nothing's happened to them you see that just the husk is taken off and they're just crushed that's it nothing else has happened and it's the same with the linseed meal you've just got the seed it's just milled up nothing is done to it whatsoever uh, and therefore you can just get the benefits um, from these things just right into your body. It's just just really great. And people do say um, to us, you know, we've got lots of little letters and so on. And strangely enough, I, I don't know whether you've seen any, but I've done a little bit of broadcasting on YouTube. <laughs> and I woke up the other night and I thought, you know, I know I'm a man, but lots of ladies are talking to <laughs> about linseed and the menopause and what can it do. And I thought maybe I ought to do a video about that. And I, I came down um, in the morning and the first phone call I had was a lady who was ordering some more meal. And she said um, uh, that it had helped her. And I was saying, would you like to kind of share with me what 
what what you felt or what happened. And it's amazing. Sometimes people might tell me more than they tell their doctor. You know, I'm not forcing them to say anything. And she said, actually, I've been suffering from migraines for most of most of my life. And of course, when I when I hit the menopause, they really um, increased. And I was having them for four or five days, and I was getting injections and so on uh, to try and just calm it down. And um, uh, she 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 came along to a show we were doing the um, uh, Spirit of Christmas last year at Olympia and I bought some meal and she said it wasn't really very long before the intensity had really um, uh, slowed down on, on on the headaches and um, she hadn't had very many she she'd had a couple through this last year and one she put down to she was going on holiday and she was flying and so on and she was still quite upset about that and she had a big one then um, but she said you know since I've been doing the linseed this has changed entirely changed um, you know the, the pattern for me and people say how how great my hair looks and so on so you know as, as a man and when people are worried about these things the ladies are worried about hormone replacement and things like that Some so they can maybe just have a little bit of experiment with linseed and sometimes you can get dramatic results as that lady uh, told me so I think I need to do that as a little video and pass it on to people mm. what do you think? I, I definitely think so so you're going to create your own female fan base I'm going to find it hard to get through to you aren't it some stage <laughs> <laughs> maybe fighting them off at the, at the beginning of the farm <laughs> the farm games well, I don't know about that but I, I have found it just amazing that from from just as I told you in the early days of being a farmer, which was pretty, pretty oppressive and very difficult on us, on a, on a small farm, um, to today when, uh, you know, people seem to be willing to say all sorts of things and ask me questions about these things. So people are searching, uh, for a change and, and, um, experimenting experimenting things and I think they're, they're, they're feeling that they don't really want to take a, a, a drug for this and that and be on things that can cause some side effects. So it's just been a journey, an amazing journey for me, uh, just from that point of view alone, uh, you know, without all the other add-on things. That's fabulous. And uh, thank you very much for doing this interview today. I really appreciate it. So if anyone wants to come and actually help you with their bare bottom, um, how, do they, uh, how do they get in touch with you to do that? And, of course, to uh, buy the meal and the flax oil from you. Well, the, the website is, uh, is www.highbarnoils.co.uk. And on there, there's the contact form. Um, that allows you to uh, contact me and say anything. And I do, at the moment, I'm able to reply to all the in emails individually. And occasionally people said, it's just amazing. We didn't expect to get an email <laughs> out specifically as a response to us. You know, so, so they just get emails that are stereotyped. I, mean, you know, I can't think of the word. Yeah. You know, just regular emails people send back. But uh, yeah, so that's that's really been great, and you can buy on the website, or you can just give us a call. The telephone number is on there as well: oh one four zero three seven three zero three two six. And generally, my sister will be answering the phone, and that's Wendy. And it's great actually that um, in the last uh, couple of years, both my sisters that I'm left with, we're all working together on the farm, doing this project, um, which is uh, really amazing. I think it's truly wonderful that it's, uh, you know, it, it's it's still family owned, which is perfect. And you've also got the YouTube channel. Is that called Lindsay TV? Well, I've, I've, I've um, you know, I've sort of had Radio Lindsay really? broad, <laughs> broadcasting to you in pictures from the depth of the Sussex country. <laughs> Little recipes I've done on there. One which is sort of the giant of the muesli thing, yeah. but I've done it with the juice. Um, which I do myself every so often. And there's one about the difference from linseed and flax. And, and then there's a little bit about the cells and so on and on the radio linseed ones. And there's a vinaigrette recipe, recipe there too. Darren, it's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you. And um, I hope my audience now all go out and uh, purchase your oils and uh, add them to their diet. Thank you, Debs. Absolutely brilliant. And you're welcome to come down any time. For a little bathe in the linseed. <laughs> With my bare bottom. <laughs>